Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. We continue to come to you online, on Facebook, on YouTube, and from our website. I'm here again this morning. Noel Martins is behind the camera. Belinda Weller is at this moment up at the organ, and uh, Tim Woods is also here to help with um, our worship and music this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, please continue to remember the Campbell family in your prayers as they are addressing some health concerns and, and some of the, the intricacies that come along with that. Also, I want to remind you that today is Pentecost Sunday, which signals the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And it also is the day when we observe one of the denomination's four special offerings for Pentecost. And this is a great um, opportunity. You can make your contribution to the Pentecost offering. Let me just tell you that 40% of the gift that you give in the Pentecost offering stays right here for ministry in this congregation to develop and support programs for young people in our church and in our community. That means that supports some of our Sunday school, some of our projects and special events that, that our youth and young people would attend. 25% uh, we send to the denomination to help with the Young Adult Volunteer Program. Another 25% supports youth ministries at the denomination. And the, the remaining 10% is devoted to uh, working with children who are at risk. So this is the very offering that supports youth and young people in our congregations and communities locally, but then also on the denominational, national, and global level. So I encourage you to please give generously. Make the notation on your check for the Pentecost offering, and it will be set aside in addition to your regular giving. We also have very exciting news. Uh, we have an opportunity that you can make your contributions online. So if you will um, go to our website, that's www.firstpresbyterianchurchaberdeen.com. And if you look on the tab of menu, you will find um, support our ministry. And there are some instructions there on how you can make your contributions online. Those are all of the announcements that I have. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us worship God.
Bless the Lord, O my soul, for the Lord our God is very great. The Lord set the earth on its foundations that shall never be shaken. How manifold are the works of the Lord! Every creature is made by God's hand. Every creature is created when the Lord sends out his spirit, giving life and breath. We will sing to the Lord as long as we live. To God alone we sing praise. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. God of creation, by your word and with your hands, you have created the earth and all that dwell in it. By your wisdom, you brought forth earth and water, mountain and valley, ocean, lake and stream, tree, bush and burrow. You created every creature, giving it life when the breath of your spirit entered it. As long as we live, we sing our praise. May our worship and meditation be pleasing to you. Amen. As it is Pentecost Sunday, as we pray for illumination and ask that our ears be opened and our hearts be opened and our eyes be opened to receive God's word, let us pray together and I'm going to invite you to sing with me, Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on us. And if you are able, you might want to stand because we're going to dance. And the motions go like this. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Let us pray. Spirit.
Our first lesson this morning comes from the book of Numbers, and it is a prayer that God would pour out God's spirit on all of God's people. I want to give you a little bit of background because as I'm very fond of doing, I like to take a nice passage and make it even nicer and bigger. So the story is this. Moses is in the wilderness with the Israelites and they are whining and complaining after having left Egypt. If only we had stayed. And Moses goes to the Lord and he says, do you see what I have to deal with these people? And so the Lord tells Moses to go and choose 70 elders from the community and that God will give those elders a portion of the spirit that has been bestowed upon Moses so that these elders might also take part in leadership and spirit-led care for the community. So we pick up at verse 24. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. The Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad. And the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp. And the young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant to Moses, one of his chosen men said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Here ends the first lesson. Now, because school has not been in session in the traditional sense over the last few months, I feel that it is my responsibility to continue lessons in grammar. So in that spirit, there are two small words that function pretty well on their own. The first is if, and the other is only. Now, grammar teachers would explain that a conditional sentence generally is a statement that is backed up by a condition. For example, we can get to brunch before the other church is let out if the pastor preaches a short sermon. You can't beat the others to brunch if the pastor doesn't preach a short sermon. You see where the condition comes in. If this, then that. Some years ago, I witnessed two pastors being arrested. The charges brought against them were preaching past noon and aiding and abetting preaching past noon. Now, it was fun to see these pastors paraded in front of the community of faith there in that church because it was a setup to raise money to purchase a van for the church. They were there in their Buncombe County Correctional Facility orange jumpsuits. 
And the church family fellowship dinner had announcements going out throughout the course of it. Here is the box that says lock them up. Here is the box that says set them free. Whichever box had the most money determined the verdict of that fellowship courtroom, all in good fun. But in church circles, preaching past noon and aiding and abetting preaching past noon are serious offenses. I will not tell you which box I put my money in. Now, the word only has its own power. It signifies a unique and singular description for qualification. For example, only guests who are taller than 48 inches may ride this ride. At the amusement park as a child, I yearned for the day when I met that 48 inch requirement. Only is a word that places a limitation on what is possible or acceptable for a particular situation. Only is a word that works to exclude people who don't meet certain criteria while including those who do. When you put the two words together, however, they create a very different meaning, one of wish, desire, lament, regret. For example, if only I had gone to the store, I could have had a scrambled egg for breakfast. Or if only I had a donut. Or if only I hadn't had that donut. The people of Israel are lamenting if only we had some meat to eat. If only we hadn't left Egypt. Moses laments before the Lord. If only I didn't have to handle your people on my own. Moses responds to the complaints about Eldad and Medad prophesying in the camp. If only the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would put his spirit on them. The Lord has placed the Holy Spirit on each one of us, and we are called to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, if only we would. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, descend upon my heart. Wean it from earth. Through all its pulses move. Stoop to my weakness, mighty as thou art, and make me love thee as I ought to love. These words we pray, these words we sing.
the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's not going to work. I printed a manuscript and now I still have to wear my glasses. For the disciples, Life with Jesus meant that they found themselves in situations that they rarely understood and could hardly have imagined. Jesus spoke in riddles without ever fully explaining himself, revealing a depth of love that was just beyond their reach. But after three years of living and traveling with Jesus, listening to him teach and preach, 
and watching him heal the sick and offer kindness to those who were deemed unworthy by the culture, I am fairly certain that they had at least learned to expect the unexpected and to look for what God was revealing in it. So when the roar of the wind came up, entering into the house where they were gathered and swirling around them, I am sure that their reaction was combined with uncertainty and fear. When the tongues of fire descended on them and rested on each of them, I am certain they were each a bit unsettled. Though I also suspect they experienced some sort of transcendent peace, having known that the promise of the coming of the Spirit was being fulfilled. Inspired and propelled by the Holy Spirit, they emerged from their grief and mourning and rejoined life in Jerusalem, where suddenly they were able to cross language barriers and communicate with people from around the world who resided in Jerusalem. Forging ahead, doing the work that Jesus had started, and sharing the good news of God's love and grace with the world. Some were amazed, searching for understanding and meaning in this new development. Others, filled with cynicism and doubt, sneered and mocked the disciples, claiming they were drunk with wine. When Peter spoke to the crowd, he proclaimed that the words of the prophet Joel were being filled, fulfilled before their very eyes. What they had hoped and prayed for over generations, it was happening. The prayers of their ancestors were finally being answered. It's happening. Some believed and some doubted. For the first time, people who had not been able to communicate with one another were finally able to hear and understand the message of the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah. Not just hear the news, but understand it because it was spoken in their own language so that there was no misunderstanding. Some believed. Some lives were forever changed. For some, however, they refused to believe what they were witnessing. They could not understand it, so they feared it, mocked it, persecuted it. They enjoyed power and status in the community and didn't want to lose such valuable standing. So they fought it, worked against it, and sabotaged it. In a cruel twist of irony, the disciples were met with the same challenges of disregard and disrespect that had been the experience of the prophets of the Lord throughout history. And yes, the experience of Messiah, God's anointed one, Jesus Christ. All of these sought to serve the Lord God faithfully. Their lives were not easy. Yet they pressed onward in a broken, stubborn, cruel world where power and riches created great disparity among the peoples, a chasm that could no longer be bridged. Such was life 
in the world, that the Lord saw fit to come to earth in the person of Jesus to see if the people could learn the language of God through the lessons taught by God's own Son. The lessons were about the law, handed down from God to the people through Moses. Just ten straightforward concepts. You and I, we know them as the Ten Commandments. Ten simple rules for living life as the people of God and to honor one another as we live in the community. The world was so broken, though, that even those ten rules for living was just too much. So when Jesus came and began his teaching and preaching, he boiled those ten down to two. Love God and love one another. And for that message, he died a violent and devastating death. Those who were in power were those who those in power who were threatened breathed a sigh of relief at the death of Jesus. Their struggle was over and they could go back to life as usual. But Jesus, being Jesus, Messiah, Savior, Redeemer, Son of God, Jesus stood in victory over death and was raised. And he appeared to his disciples and to others, continuing to teach and preach and to love. The disciples, their lives were changed forever. Jesus had taught them how to live in love instead of living in fear. Jesus had taught them how to pray and also how to listen for the voice of God in response to those prayers. Jesus had taught them how to be led by love of brother and sister, neighbor and stranger, friend and enemy. The day had come, and it was happening. The Holy Spirit had arrived, strengthening, inspiring, and emboldening them to leave their holy huddle and take their work into the mission field. This crew of rookies was finally ready to start their careers of service to the Lord in the LNF. The Love Never Fails League. It is entirely possible that your pastor is missing sports a bit too much. Some people received the disciples and their words of love and hope, their assurances of God's grace and love. For the first time since the people were strewn to every corner of the earth, from the Tower of Babel. The language barriers had been broken down and people could communicate in language that they could understand. The disciples had been given the power to speak in all of the languages of the world, yet it was shored up by one language, the language of God. And God is love. The language of God is love and it transcends barriers of every kind. It is amazing what can be communicated through a loving action. Some years ago, I was living in France 
And I would often witness people at the ticket window at a train or a metro station struggling to purchase a ticket or ask directions because they didn't understand the language. Sometimes, I would stop and offer assistance, asking, do you need help? Where are you going? And then I would turn to the clerk at the window and I would say, they need a ticket to this place, that city. And the clerk would help, they would complete their transaction, and I would make sure that that person got through the gate and was pointed in the right direction of their train platform. I would offer that assistance, much to the relief of the distressed traveler. However, in my shame, there were also those moments when I would not take the time because the person who was struggling so with the language was being rude and causing a scene. In my judgment, they didn't deserve my help. I carry the shame to this day because that is not what Jesus would have done that was not me at my most loving. That was me at my most human and judgmental. The Pentecost message is so important that God saw fit to equip the disciples with language skills to transcend communication barriers so that the whole world could know the living God and experience the love and grace that God has for every person in every nation of the creation. For we, each of us, we are created and beloved by God. So who are we to withhold that love from one another. If we believe this Pentecost message, if we believe that Jesus was sent to redeem and save the world, and if we believe that the Holy Spirit descends on us to guide and inspire our work in the world, then shouldn't we get to work and let God's love guide our hearts minds and actions? My guess is that you have been watching the news unfold these past weeks and your heart has been broken. The climbing death toll from the novel coronavirus pandemic and the mass graves that are being dug in Brazil put knots in our stomachs. Unemployment numbers released by the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics in April reported that nationally, the rate of unemployed Americans was nearly 15%. Projections for May estimate that rate will grow to 20%. Friends, that is one in every five Americans who is out of work. Violence continues in our communities and we have seen video just recently of two men dying at the hands of others. Armed demonstrators muscle their way into buildings as a show of force in an attempt to find relief from oppression. Bullying and hate our way of life, accepted and unchallenged, because those who have tried to stand up against it have been crushed. I hate to tell you this, 
But these recent developments are nothing new. Systemic oppression has been a way of life since the beginning of time. Exploitation of those who do not have power or voice has been going on for generations. Think about the Israelites captive in Egypt, making bricks out of mud and straw. Exploitation of those who do not have power or voice continues. Those in need are pressed into situations from which they can never escape. If you are like me, your heart breaks just a little bit more each time we hear a story about a mass shooting, a hate crime, a violent uprising, rioting, and protest against injustice with no relief in sight. What is it that breaks God's heart? The answer is simple yet profound. God's heart is broken when we fail to love one another. And this is why the Holy Spirit rests upon us, encourages us, emboldens us, guides us. God is love. Jesus came to teach us to love. The Spirit guides us to live in love. This is the work the disciples began. And it is the work of the church. And it continues today. So how do we do it? I'm so glad you asked. Some three years ago, Sojourners Magazine ran an article written by Courtney Ariel entitled, To Our White Friends Desiring to Be Allies. Now, the article was written following the unrest in the community of Ferguson, a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri, when the community was up in arms over the shooting death of Michael Brown. This article was a means of responding to the question, how can we help? Ariel offers several suggestions. First, listen more, talk less. Second, resist the urge or need to share an opinion. Simply sit with the experience your neighbor is describing. Third, educate yourself about systemic racism, and I wouldn't limit it to racism. I would talk about systemic oppression. Use your voice to point to the voices of those who are marginalized, not your story. Promote their story. Please refrain from I can't believe something like this would happen in this day and age. Hatred and violence have been in America for centuries, and such declarations, according to this author, diminish the experience of the marginalized and disenfranchised. Ask questions of people that you know and trust be respectful in those conversations. Do your own research in support. Finally, stop talking about colorblindness. It's not a thing, Ariel says. The article was written as a tool for combating racism, but I believe the suggestions can be used in relation to any type of systemic oppression. The very reason Jesus came into the world was to level the playing field and point out the issues surrounding it, 
to draw attention to it and bring it into others' awareness so that they could address it and work to fix it. We cannot fix it alone. We need God's help, which comes to us in the person of Jesus Christ who taught his disciples to love. We need God's Holy Spirit, which propels us into the world to share that love. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had it right when he said these words. As you press on for justice, be sure to move with dignity and discipline, using the only weapon, only the, using only the weapon of love. Let no man pull you so low as to hate him. Always avoid violence. If you succumb to the temptation of using violence in your struggle, unborn generations will be the recipients of a long and desolate night of bitterness, and your chief legacy to the future will be an endless reign of meaningless chaos. A few years later, he wrote, hate begets hate. Violence begets violence. Toughness begets a greater toughness. We must meet the forces of hate with the power of love. Some five years later, he adds to that thought, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate multiplies hate. Violence multiplies violence. And toughness multiplies toughness in a descending spiral of destruction. The chain reaction of evil, hate begetting hate, wars producing more wars, must be broken or we shall be plunged into the dark abyss of annihilation. The language of God is love, and that love transcends all barriers. Will we get it right every time? Nope. Not even most of the time. Did you know that in 2018, the batting average across Major League Baseball was a 248. In the modern era of baseball, that average reached its highest of 296 in 1930. Even professional baseball players don't hit the ball at every at-bat. In fact, on average, they don't even hit the ball 30% of the time. I think our odds of loving one another are much better than that. We have better odds, and we have the grace of God which is poured out on us. Let us be led by love, and let us be propelled into the world by the Holy Spirit to share that love. Put us in, Coach. Jesus and the Holy Spirit have made sure that we are ready. And we sing these words in prayer.
Amen. As you are able, let us declare what we believe using the words of the Church and the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. received God's Holy Spirit that propels us and guides us into the world and inspires us to offer ourselves and our very gifts. In these moments, let us renew our commitment as disciples of Jesus Christ and offer ourselves and our very gifts to God as we go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, who created all that is and all that has been and all that is yet to be, continue to breathe your Holy Spirit upon us. Continue to guide us in lives that openly display love, Love for those who are easy to love. Love for those who are difficult. Love for friend and love for enemy. Love for children and love for the elderly. Teach us to love, O oh God. Help us to learn how to share that love. With love and in prayer, O oh God, we pray for your world, for districts and cities of unrest and violence, where demonstrations have become protestations, where cities burn instead of weep in grief. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O oh God, and inspire your people to love, knowing that love begets love, and that love transcends every barrier in our way. 
We pray for our nation, for those who are unemployed and cannot secure work, for those who are unsettled and driven out of their homes due to lack of income. We pray for your people, O God. Grant us wisdom to support your children as we are able. We pray for the nations of the world as they battle COVID-19, and especially in the winter months in South America. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Brazil and Mexico, where death tolls are uncountable and unimaginable. We pray for this country as our death toll climbs above 100,000 and ask, O God, how long? How long will we be unsettled? How long, O Lord, will we be apart from one another? How much longer, O Lord? We pray for your people with sighs too deep for words, knowing that your love transcends every language. And so we offer these words that Jesus taught us using the boldness of children and praying with love. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, the Spirit rests upon us. Go out into the world. Be led by God's love, knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, communion, and inspiration of the Holy Spirit are with us now and forever. Amen.